talking with Gavin Andresen. He's the lead developer for Bitcoin. Hi, Gavin. Hi. So you, I guess on a personal note to start out with, you live in Massachusetts, is that right? Yeah, I do. I live in Amherst, Massachusetts. Okay. You know, I went to college at UMass Amherst, so I'm very familiar with that area. Oh, good. Did you take any geology courses? No, I didn't. Um, I was a biochemistry major. My wife's a geology professor there, which is why we're there. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I really like the area um, as someone who's... Uh, very anti-war. Personally, myself, there were always peace demonstrations, even like, you know, uh, well, almost 10 years ago when I was an undergraduate. So do you like living there? Yeah, Amherst is a great place to live. I mean, you know, I have two kids. It's a wonderful place to raise kids. It's a college town, so there's always interesting things happening there. Um, I highly recommend it. Cool. So I first found out about about you a couple years ago because um, you, I remember, had lunch with Ian and Mark, my colleagues at Free Talk Live, and you were trying to sell them on the idea of this Bitcoin thing, and they were like, what the hell is this Bitcoin thing? But this guy wants to meet us for lunch. Okay, we'll listen to him. So do you remember that? Oh, yeah, I remember that lunch. Yeah, I drove up to Keene and met with Ian and Mark, who were late, if I recall. Uh, but yeah, no, we had a very nice lunch, and I talked about this crazy experiment called Bitcoin that was just starting to become interesting. And if I recall correctly, Mark paid for my lunch and I paid him in Bitcoin. Oh, cool. I bet he's uh, happy with that now. <laughs> yeah, I think if, if he kept them, and you could ask him if he kept them, then, you know, it turned out to be a pretty good deal for him. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so how did you first, you know, get involved with Bitcoin? I mean, what was your story from the very beginning? Sure. Well, I was actually looking around for, for an interesting project to get involved in. And I talked to a couple of friends in Amherst about potential startup businesses. And nothing really stuck. Um, but while I was in the process of, of doing that, I've done startup businesses in the past, I stumbled across this really interesting open source project called Bitcoin. I just saw a, a link to a blog that was talking about it. It caught my interest. You know, I've been interested in economics and cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer technologies. And so I read everything I could about it. Back then, you could actually read everything pretty much that had ever been written about Bitcoin because it was still pretty small. This was in May of 2010. Okay, yeah. And then uh, I did the simplest possible project I could possibly think of just to, you know, I'm a programmer, so mm -hmm. I got to try it to see if it will work and get my feet wet with it, which was... Um, this website that became famous called the Bitcoin Faucet. Yes, I remember that. And it was giving away, like, what, five Bitcoins or something. Everyone... When we started, yeah, <laughs> I, I spent 50 whole dollars and bought 10,000 Bitcoins. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> back then, you could buy for $50. And then I gave them away five at a time. Until and did I... that change over time? Did it get less? Or... Oh, yeah. As yeah. the Bitcoin price went up, I had to decrease it repeatedly because it turns out if you give away more than a certain amount, it becomes profitable for people to try to really cheat it and get more than their fair share. Right. <laughs> so that's really interesting. So you started the Bitcoin faucet and that was your first Bitcoin project. And then when did you start working on the code? It was actually right around that same time. I, I started to uh, communicate with Satoshi, the, the, you know, the creator of Bitcoin, and started to you know, help out with maintenance of the code, submit improvements to the code. And that became just basically my full-time job uh, you know I that was all I was doing doing it as a volunteer for the open source project mm -hmm. um, got sucked in kind of deeper and deeper so you caught the bug from the very beginning you were you caught the Bitcoin bug what did you see as a potential back in 2009 was it I mean two, 2010, 2010 when, when, when excuse I me heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so back in 2010 what did you see as the potential for Bitcoin or did you not really know but thought it was really exciting like what were you thinking as far as the future well, you know, I, would, I thought that there was a small possibility that it would become really, really, really big. And, you know, working on things that have a potential of becoming really, really big, that's kind of the definition of an entrepreneur who's interested in big ideas. Right. And so it's actually become much bigger, much quicker than I expected. So, you know, we have over a thousand people here at this conference. If you'd asked me back in 2010 if there would be a Bitcoin conference you know, attracting over a thousand people, I would have laughed at you and said, no, nah, it's <laughs> going to take at least five or 10 years before we get to that level of interest. But no, it's, it's really exceeded my expectations. And you said you were interested in economics before this. Can you tell me a little more about that? Yeah. Um, I'm mostly a libertarian. I say mostly because I'm not all the way a libertarian, but... And what are your sticking points? Just curious. 
I do think there's a role for government. I even think that there might be a bit of a role of realizing that people can be lucky and make a lot of money. And, you know, maybe there is a role for taking some of the money that people make merely because they're lucky and maybe heard about Bitcoin when it was really early and, you know, giving that to people who, who maybe weren't so lucky. So I, I kind of do believe in a, a minimal social safety net, which will probably set but me But you apart. did that voluntarily. I did with the Bitcoin faucet, right? And that was the idea of, you know, spreading You didn't need wealth. a government to tell you you have to do it. They didn't. And I think you could have a completely voluntary system. But I think there would be a long way to get there. Want to set up an online store that accepts Bitcoins? Go to openbitcoinstore.com and you can have a store up and running before the end of this message. Just enter your email address and the store name, and in less than 30 seconds, you'll have a secure WordPress e-commerce site up and running that accepts Bitcoins and pays you in cash within 24 hours. And best of all, it's completely free. Go to openbitcoinstore.com today and open for business now. Let's Talk Bitcoin is heard each week by thousands of people who are participating in the new digital economy. Our listener base of Bitcoin owners, miners, investors, technologists, and merchants is growing fast. We offer a limited number of short advertising slots in each show to keep our listeners engaged and to provide maximum impact for our sponsors. If you'd like to talk to us about Let's Talk Bitcoin, send us an email at sponsors at letstalkbitcoin.com. Did you know that uh, I'm going to give a moderate a panel tomorrow about nonprofits using Bitcoin? And we're here with three nonprofit organizations today, you know, talking about why Bitcoin is great for nonprofits and nonprofits are great for Bitcoin, too, because it shows that, you know, that this does have totally um, charitable, legitimate uses used Absolutely. to help people. So. Yeah, I, I love seeing people using, you know, Bitcoin to do good. It just it's great for Bitcoin. It's it lowers it's great for the world. It really lowers the barrier for entry for um, charities as well because, I mean, starting up uh, Free Aid, which is a volunteer first aid organization that I work with, you know, we had to register for all these bank accounts and PayPal locked down our account twice for seemingly no reason. And, you know, we really started to see the value of Bitcoin right away because that just can't happen with Bitcoin. And there's transparency built in too because, you know, you can audit the blockchain anytime you want. You can see what Bitcoins we have and where we pay them out to. I mean, I guess you'd have to know whose addresses we're paying them out to, but you can see what we have and, and our assets on hand. So I think that's really valuable for a charity to have that available and that kind of transparency built in. Tell me more about your interest in economics. I don't think I'll let you finish about that. Yeah, I, I actually never took an economics class in, in college and never really got interested in economics until later in life when I started to become more of a libertarian, quite frankly, and started to read, you know, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Oh, great book, yeah. Which is a great book. And, you know, just a bunch of other you know, books that really talk about how our money system works and, and how the economy works. And it really made a lot of sense to me. You know, I'm a programmer. So I like to know how things work. Yeah, absolutely. And so the more I learned about how things work, kind of the more interested I got in learning more about how the economy works. And, you know, is Keynesian economics correct or not? I don't think it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and just those kind of ideas come to fruition in Bitcoin as this really interesting experiment in a very different economic model based on this, you know, really hard money. It's also global. So that's really interesting. And a deflationary currency, which I was I was just talking to uh, Robert Wenzel about this. He uh, does the Economic Policy Journal. I've never seen a deflationary currency in my lifetime. You know, I've always lived in the U.S. and I'm, I'm around 30. And I've always grown up with incentives to spend the money that I have because it's going to be losing its value and also to borrow, quite frankly, because when you repay that debt, it's going to be cheaper. You know, right. And I never really had strong incentives to save. And with Bitcoin, there are strong incentives to save because it could be worth a lot more in the future, right? Some people may think of that as hoarding, but you know, you can also think of it as saving, right? As accumulating wealth that you maybe want to do something with later, right? Absolutely, yeah. And it it is interesting. You know, I'm I'm paid in Bitcoin, so my my salary is now paid by the Bitcoin Foundation. Cool. <laughs> in Bitcoin, and you know, I I don't spend all those Bitcoin right away. And so I'm rewarded for delaying gratification, right? I mean, because Bitcoin tends to become more valuable over time, you know, you kind of think twice about, do I really need 
that candy bar or whatever. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I really need that ten thousand Bitcoin pizza. Right? No, well, it, yeah, exactly. And it, I mean, the hoarding, the hoarding thing is interesting because there's another dynamic, which is you know if you've been holding for a while, you kind of get free money, and so you're like, ah, I had ten Bitcoin. You know, I had you know a pizza worth of Bitcoins. Now it's worth two pizzas. I might as well buy a pizza and right. still have a pizza worth of Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think the whole system will work itself out. The other interesting thing about that pizza, though, there's sort of a paradox there because that guy helped make Bitcoin what it is today. He helped legitimize it and make it known that it can be used as a medium of exchange. From what I've heard, you know, he's not upset that he spent ten thousand on a on a pizza, right? Well, I'm the guy who gave away ten thousand. Yeah, that's right. The fa- so you know, I've given yeah. away what one point two million dollars worth of bitcoins, and yeah, again, it's amazing. I don't regret it either because if I hadn't have done that, you know, you don't, it bootstraps the economy and, you know, spending, spending your coins makes any coins that you still hold more valuable. Yeah, absolutely. I think those two incentives to save and to spend are kind of balanced by both of those factors. So yeah, it's interesting to talk about that. So are you working on any other Bitcoin projects besides just the code or is that taking up your whole time? Right now, I am 100% on the core development, on the code, on being the chief scientist of the Bitcoin Foundation and thinking about what problems are we going to encounter next as Bitcoin gets, you know, even more wildly popular. Mm-hmm. So, what are the biggest problems on the plate? What do you think are, are going to be the next challenges? A scalability, so scaling up to handle more transactions just requires some changes to the software that we're running, which is, you know, scalability is a really good problem to have. Yeah, definitely. So that that's a big issue. I mean, I've been working on wallet security a lot. I think we need to make it much harder to either have your Bitcoins stolen or to lose your Bitcoins. So there's actually a lot of work on top of kind of the low-level Bitcoin to make that happen. A lot of, you know, user interface work just to make Bitcoin easier to use. So there's there's plenty to be done. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm not Satoshi. No. <laughs> okay, we have you on the record for that. <laughs> Where can people find you if they want to follow you on Twitter or just keep keep in touch with you? Where can they go? I'm pretty easy to find. I mean, Gavin Andreessen, at Gavin Andreessen is my Twitter handle. Gavin Andreessen at gmail.com is my email address. If you Google Gavin Andreessen, you'll find out lots about me. So, you know. Does the Bitcoin faucet still exist? The, I had to shut the Bitcoin faucet down. I okay, turn it off. I, I turned it off because I didn't I, I didn't have time to work on the code to prevent the cheaters from cheating, unfortunately. Yep, I gotcha. Okay, Gavin, thank you so much for talking with me today. I really appreciate your time. No problem. Great to talk to you. Okay.